And a very good morning to you all, however you're watching or however you're joining in our worship this morning. It is a privilege to be here to, to lead our thinking and our worship. And as, um, as Jenny mentioned, uh, Andrew has rather set the scene uh, by saying that this is an exciting visit. Uh, I, I wondered how do I live up to that? Do I start cartwheeling across the front or something? That isn't going to happen just for the benefit of uh, doubt. But um, it's interesting to lead worship on, on Valentine's Day. I used to have a joke uh, back in an old job where I used to say, on Valentine's Day I'll show I shall be in late because I will have to fight my way past all the cards that are addressed to me that have mounted up at my front door. And if you'll believe that, you'll believe anything. But actually, we are going to be thinking about the topic of love this morning. Love can mean many things. But one of the most profound ways that we show love is perhaps to carve out time in our lives for other people. And really, that's what we're doing this morning. We mark this time together as special. It's a time to focus on our Creator God, to confess the things that we don't get right, and to be thankful for all the blessings that we have received. So let's start that time with a time of prayer together. Let's pray. Lord God, our Creator, we praise you. Not only for the power you displayed when you created the world out of nothing, but also for the love with which you continually hold your creation in caring hands. We praise you for the way you have demonstrated your sovereign will not only through your creation, but also through the continuing recreation of all things, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. We have come to add our praises to those who down the centuries and all across the world have seen your glory, recognized your purpose, and responded to your love. Lord God, our creator, we're only too aware that our praises will never be worthy of you. We ask that you will receive the songs that we sing, the prayers that we offer, and the commitments we make. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, transform our thoughts into praise that bring you glory. We bring to you the mistakes we've made over the past week. The thoughts and actions that didn't reflect your teaching of love and grace. The times we've been selfish. The times we've judged or condemned others the times that we've been too quick to attack and too slow to forgive. What mercy, what grace you show to accept our confessions and to forgive us. How can we thank you for the hope and joy that you bring to our lives? If we could count the times you have forgiven and accepted us, would we ever stop falling on our knees in thanksgiving, adoration, and praise? But as it is, you call us to look forward with confidence, to follow you. You give us hope. You give us strength. And you give us joy. So may you draw closer to us this morning. May our hearts and minds respond to your spirit. Draw us all together as one family of believers, wherever we may physically be, that we may learn more about you 
and find more ways to serve your kingdom in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to continue our prayer in our first song. You are beautiful beyond description. You are beautiful beyond description To marvelous for words To wonderful for comprehension like nothing ever seen or heard Who can grasp your infinite wisdom Who can fathom the depth of your love You are beautiful beyond description Majesty enthroned above And I stand, I stand in awe of you I stand, I stand in awe of you, holy God to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvellous for one. Too wonderful for comprehension Like nothing ever seen or heard Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description Majesty enthroned above and I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. Our reading this morning is from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his word. Thank you so much, Jenny, and thank you, Andrew, and everyone else here for making me feel so welcome and making it so easy for me to just turn up and, and uh, share with you this morning. The transfiguration, eh? Quite likely many of you have heard lots said about this biblical event. It is a key moment in Jesus' ministry. 
quite likely the time when Peter, James, and John, three of Jesus' closest followers and friends, became finally convinced that Jesus really was the Son of God, the Messiah that had been predicted by the prophets of the Old Testament so many years earlier. And there's a lot that we can say about it. There's a lot I could say about it. There's a lot to think about. There's a lot to investigate, a lot to research. I mean, surely this must be one of the strangest events depicted in the Bible. Jesus heads up to the top of a mountain with three friends, and suddenly his clothes become a dazzling white. And then Jesus is, as the Bible puts it, transfigured, which translated means to change into another form. I mean, what does that mean? That's the sort of stuff we see in science fiction films, isn't it? Now, I could have researched and talked to you about that for hours, but I'm not going to. Anyway, then there's the appearance of two major characters from the Old Testament, Elijah and Moses, solidifying Jesus' place as the fulfillment of those promises from the Old Testament. But why would these two characters show up? And what were they talking to Jesus about? Whole books and theses have been written and presented about that element of this uh, story alone. But I'm not going to talk to you about that either. Then there's Peter, James, and John's reaction to all of this. Most of the time, especially in the Old Testament, when God reveals himself in physical ways like this, the human observer is normally totally at a loss for words. They are awestruck. I love the fact that here, Peter, rather than being unable to speak, appears to start babbling some nonsense about needing to go and get shelters uh, for the three men. Talk about a comment coming straight out of the left field. Mark, who is writing this account, even feels the need, it seems, to excuse these strange comments. And he explains that Peter was so afraid by what he was seeing, he didn't know what he was talking about. Some people are like that, aren't they? When they get nervous, they just talk and talk and talk. And yes, I am nervous standing here, so that will probably explain that to you. So I really could speak to you about their response for ages, but I'm not going to. No, I'm not going to talk about any of those things. Well, not anymore, anyway. What I actually want to think about this morning is what happens when God actually speaks. In the passage, a cloud appears, and the voice of God is heard. And God says in the translation we heard, just ten words, and then everything vanishes and Jesus is alone again. So I think this is absolutely the culmination of this whole event. I think those ten words matter. And what are they? Verse 7. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Ten words. Now maybe it's because I'm a soppy fellow or maybe it's because it's Valentine's Day, but those words, they hit me right in my heart. Ten words making three points. Three points that God wants us to hear. Three points that were so important, God spoke them directly from the heavens. Well, when it comes to things being three in threes, being a Methodist local preacher means I am very well versed in delivering a three-point sermon. So let's go through those three points, shall we? So firstly, this is my son. Jesus isn't just a messenger. He isn't just a prophet. He isn't just someone who God has gifted to spread his message on earth. It's, it's more than that. It's deeper than that. It's a link so strong that the closest way it can be described for us is as a, a paternal or, or a family relationship. 
And I don't think we should get too caught up in the son, daughter, child thing either. Other Bible versions translate it as this is my own. However you might understand or or describe it, really it's about a deep relational connection. And it's about assuring us that Jesus is one with God. We can know that when we learn about Jesus, we are learning about God. God has a relationship with Jesus. So when we have a relationship with Jesus, we too have a relationship with God. And what is the nature of that relationship? Well, that's what the next three words go on to describe. Whom I love. Now, in one sense, this isn't all that surprising, is it? I mean, God loves us all, doesn't he? Yes, he does. But what perhaps is key here is that God chooses to tell us that he loves Jesus. Over everything else, over all other details and ways of understanding how God works and what God does, is this detail that God loves. And if love is the cornerstone, the key aspect that God highlights to us here, then doesn't it follow that it should also be the cornerstone of our own lives if we're trying to follow the ways of God? Shouldn't we be demonstrating love at every opportunity to every person that our lives brings us into contact with? The more I study scripture, the more I reflect on what God says, the things Jesus did, I am more convinced that, to put it slightly cheesily, love is the way. Now, I say cheesily because when we hear little sentences like that, love is the way, the only way is love, I wonder if we sometimes smirk or or scoff a little, because it does sound like an 80s pop song, doesn't it? Or perhaps you might think it's a naive worldview that doesn't take into account how people actually behave. Because sometimes love isn't actually something that society approves of. I mean, really radical love, and if you think about it, can any true form of love not be radical, is about putting others first. It's about not looking the other way when someone is in need. It's about drawing alongside those who might do nothing to improve our personal standing. Really radical love is an openness, a willingness to do things differently, a desire not to let the trappings of earth or the world around us uh, to be the defining points in the decisions that we make or the actions that we take. And isn't that what, throughout the Bible, God and Jesus constantly demonstrate? Using people who did not come from the forms of society that people expected, like like fishermen and, and carpenters, challenging injustice and hypocrites, even when the religious arguments for the status quo were very well understood. Think of the Good Samaritan who didn't walk by on the other side, the the woman at the well who Jesus totally identified himself with. Most of us feel comfortable in the society that we live in, and we do tend to get attracted and used to feeling comfortable. I certainly know I do. But it's good to remember that sometimes love doesn't actually sit comfortably. It's not comfortable to hear the plight of immigrants, the opinions of people who disagree with us, the experience of people who have felt marginalized, mistreated, or even abused because of their skin color, their gender, because of their romantic attractions or their life choices. It's not always comfortable. But demonstrating love isn't always comfortable. And it really is so important to listen to others as a way of demonstrating love towards them. 
And I know this to be true. Why do I know it to be true? Well, because of what God says in the next bit of this verse we're looking at. He said, Jesus is my son whom I love. Listen to him. I want you to note that God does not say, do what he says, or worship him, or serve him. I mean, he could do. If God had said those things, I'm sure Peter, James, and John would have, would have done just that. But no, God's command is actually perhaps rather harder than all of those things. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Hear what he says. Observe what he does. Understand his character. Think about your response. Act on your own conclusion. Now, of course, when his followers did those things, and when we listen to Jesus, we often conclude that obeying him, worshipping him, serving him is absolutely the right thing to do, and it's often what we want to do. But that is quite a different thing to just acting out those things because your religion tells you to do so. And it's why even though many of us can't be in a church building on a Sunday morning, we're still tuning in over the internet, or we're connecting in some other way to listen to Jesus, to hear about, God, to hear about God's love all the same. Because it's not about the building or the traditions or anything like that, it's about the relationship. But it seems as though God is saying that these things come as a result of listening. And listening comes as a result of loving. Jesus is God's own. God loves Jesus. God wants us to listen to Jesus. And I want to point out that uh, we're not just talking about hearing. It is quite possible to hear things without actually listening to them. And maybe you're hard of hearing. That doesn't mean you don't listen. Listening is, it's about taking in, understanding, considering. It's actually a deliberate act on our part. If we listen to Jesus, we will grow to love him. And if we love Jesus, we must listen more. Listening is part and parcel of loving. Can you really truly love someone if you can't listen to them? If you can't take in and try to understand what they're saying? If we want to love someone, if we want to demonstrate the love that we truly believe is God's character, that we truly believe we have been shown ourselves by God, then we must also listen deeply and sincerely. How good are we at listening and loving? And not only when it comes to our faith, but when it comes to living our everyday lives. Listening is powerful. You've probably heard of prison schemes where criminals are invited to listen to their victims' statements and feelings. And likewise, many victims also listen to their attackers' experiences and thoughts. And it can be really hard, really tough, really upsetting. But it can also lead to understanding, perhaps even to forgiveness. Can we listen to people with contrary views to us without getting agitated? Now, it doesn't mean we need to agree, but the act of really listening to someone really is a sign of love towards our neighbor. Or perhaps we use up our love on things that can't talk back, so we don't have to listen to them. You know, things like material, worldly stuff, money, the latest tech, clothes. 
Perhaps that's where we focus our efforts and our feelings. But being guided by such things rarely ends well, and we are made for so much more. So it's not always easy. And Jesus certainly demonstrated that in his earthly life. He loved the world. He loved you and I so much that he was beaten, mistreated, and killed on a cross. An act that rippled through the ages as a beacon of what it means to sacrifice yourself for the love of another. But that love of God, that power also rose Jesus from the dead. It showed us that Jesus really was, really is, the way, the truth, and the life. So on this Valentine's Day, as we think about the whole concept of love and what that means to us, I think we should remember that listening is a sincere act of love. Let's do it more. And maybe now that I think about it, that's what the transfiguration might really be about. You remember that idea of transforming into another form? Perhaps through recognizing Jesus as God's own, through understanding that God's relationship is, formed, is, is a relationship formed through love, and by demonstrating that love to everyone we encounter. Perhaps that is what really transforms us into better versions of ourselves. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Amen. I wonder if God has placed something on your heart or in your mind uh, while we've been thinking about uh, the transfiguration this morning. I want to give you an opportunity um, to consider your response uh, to what we've been thinking about. So I encourage you to do so as we um, sing or as we reflect on our next song, God of Justice, Saviour to All. Justice, Savior of all, come to rescue the weak and the poor, chose to serve and not be served. Jesus, you have called us, freely we receive, now freely we will give, we must go. Stand beside the broken, we must go. Stepping forward, keep us just from singing. Move us into action, we must go. To act justly every day, loving mercy in every way. Walking humbly before you, God. You have shown us what you require. Freely we receive, now freely we will give. We must go, lift to feed the hungry, stand beside the broken. We must go, stepping forward. Keep us just from singing, move us into action, we must go, we must go, live to feed the hungry, stand beside the broken, we must go, stepping forward, keep us just from
from seeing, move us into action, we must go. Fill us up and send us out. Fill us up and send us out. Fill us up and send us out, Lord. Fill us up and send us out. Fill us up and send us out. Fill us up and send us out, Lord. Fill us up and send us out. Fill us up and send us out. Fill us up and send us out, Lord. We must go. Live to fill the hungry, stand beside the broken, we must go. Stepping forward, keep us just from seeing, move us into action, we must go. I want to continue our theme of how listening can be a demonstration of love in our lives. So for our prayers this morning, I'm going to read a selection of reflections, and they all begin with the words, I am. And these are prayers that will put us in mind of the experiences of others. And though they're, they're just examples of the sorts of situations and experiences that we can pray for. I hope they may also encourage us in what it truly means to listen. So let's pray. I am a patient. I sit here, I'm waiting my turn to see the doctor. I'm torn apart. I don't want to see them, but I know I must. I'm fearful that the news that I'll be given may change my whole life forever. What will my future look like? Can I have hope? Pray for me. I am a world leader. I don't have time for joy. It's a luxury that is denied me. You have no idea of the responsibilities laid upon my shoulders, the pitfalls that I must try to avoid. And no matter what I say or do, someone will see some evil intent and others will reject everything out of hand. When was it that the burden that I carry crushed the joy out of my life? Pray for me. I work in the health service. I entered what I considered to be a caring profession, and to me it was a kind of calling. I wanted to care for patients to help those in need, but my job seemed to become a political football, to be kicked around by both politicians and patients, and then this latest crisis. Everyone forgets that we're human. We're bound to make mistakes, but the hassle, the aggression, the long hours, they're now taking their toll. Will things ever get better? Pray for me.
I am a leader of worship. And whether I'm a worship leader or a preacher or a minister, I felt I was answering the greatest calling there could be. But all the complaints, the lack of appreciating, it's all I ever seem to face. They don't like the hymns, they're too old, they're too new. Some want constant experiment in worship and others want to keep it the way it has always been. The sermon was too honest, too challenging, too long. I haven't lost my faith or my calling, and nor have I lost my joy in serving God, but maybe others are stealing a bit of it from me. Pray for me. I am just a person. I wonder if I've forgotten what life is all about. I'm surrounded by lotteries and gambling, games of chance. Is all life like that, just the luck of the draw? Is it all down to the fall of a dice or the turn of a card? Surely there's more to life than is offered by those whose lives are ruled by superstition or what they think they read in the stars. I need a new experience of knowing that God loves me and that I matter to him. I want to know that deep joy of walking with Christ knowing that I can smile no matter the storms I encounter. Pray for me. Lord, I pray that you will put into our minds the people, the situations that we can listen to, that we can understand more, that we can show love to. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers this morning. Amen. And shall we say together, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. So as we approach the end of our worship this morning, we remember that we can be the answer to our own prayers. We can hear the call of the kingdom, lift our eyes to the king. Let his song arise within you as a fragrant offering of how God, rich in mercy, came in Christ to redeem all who trust in his unfailing grace. Hear the call of the kingdom to be children of light. 
with the mercy of heaven, the humility of Christ, walking justly before him, loving all that is right, that the life of Christ may shine through us. King of heaven, we will answer the call, we will follow, bringing hope to the world, filled with passion, filled with power to proclaim salvation in Jesus' name. Hear the call of the kingdom to reach out to the lost, with the Father's compassion in the wonder of the cross, bringing peace and forgiveness and a hope yet to come. Let the nations put their trust in Him. King of heaven, we will answer the call, we will follow, bringing hope to the world filled with passion, Filled with power to proclaim salvation in Jesus' name. Thank you so much again, everyone. So as we end our time of worship this morning, whatever our day, whatever our week brings, be it busier than we would like or, or quieter than we would like, may we find the time, the inclination, and the love to really listen. To listen to those who God is calling us to serve and to bless, just as we have been blessed. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.